So something you see on mathematics, Reddit and YouTube and whatnot is something ridiculous, like the sum of all the integers, one, two, three, four, etc. If you take that off to infinity, then it sums to minus 112. Now, there's a, a reason why people say this, and it's because of a really wonky way of summing series, and so people sort of disregard that fact. And they say, well, regular sums are more cogent and understandable. But I want to give you an example of how regular sums can go very, very wrong. And it's very not intuitive. It confused people for a long time. I'm going to show you how math can break, and then what people can do to fix it. And so let's go ahead and jump into it. So in the 19th century, over 100 years ago, Dirichlet discovered that if you take a series and you do some clever bookkeeping, that you can double its value. What this essentially means is that if you were really clever with your accounting, that you could double your money without making any investment at all. This was so counterintuitive and it confused the heck out of Dirichlet and many other mathematicians. And the issue wasn't resolved until Riemann published a paper after his death. And this paper was on Fourier series. Here, let's talk about what Dirichlet did real quick. So, what Dirichlet discovered was that if he took a sum and he moved the terms around, he could actually get it to be twice the sum of a particular series. It's like if I were to take you know, these textbooks and I were to pile them up on my desk, but then I reshuffle them and they're suddenly twice as tall. Now that's really counterintuitive and it confused the heck out of Dirichlet. It's like if I were to take a pile of money and I just reordered the money and then I get double that money. I mean, if that were actually possible, if that happened, then every mathematician would be like the richest guy in the world that we'd spend every morning doubling our money. Just reshuffle and ta-da, I have more money. So we know not every mathematician is the richest man in the world. So that must mean that something is wrong here. So why don't we go ahead and figure out exactly what that is. And I'm going to start by telling you exactly what Dirichlet did and how he achieved his result. Three weeks later. All right. So uh, this, this is taking me a few tries to get this explanation right. And so I think this is probably the best I can do. So what happened is that Dirichlet looked at the alternate harmonic series and he doubled it. So you get this, you get this two over one minus two over two plus two over three minus two over four, et cetera. And we know that should give us twice the natural log of two because we know the alternating harmonic series sums to the natural log of two. Now, what he did is he took a look at the denominators. Anytime there's an odd denominator, a denominator like say this guy or this guy or this guy, and he moved them next to twice that denominator. So this guy here, uh, it'll, it stays where it is because it's already next to 2 over 2. But the 2 over 3 moves to be next to 2 over 6, and the 2 over 5 moves to be over to the 2 over 10, and the 2 over 7 over to the 2 over 14, etc. And what he's going to do is he's going to combine, he's going to shuffle those around, and then he's going to get another result. It's going to be half the original result, which is completely bonkers. So what we're going to have is we have now the 2 over 1 minus the 2 over 2. They're staying together. Okay. Now uh, the 2 thirds moved over to the 2 6, so we're not going to write that next. So this guy here now becomes minus 2 over 4. 2 over 5, that moves over to the 2 over 10. And so now I'm going to get plus uh, 2 over 3 minus 2 over 6. And now I have the 2 over 7 moved to the 2 over 14, so that's not there. And now I have minus 2 over 8, so that stays where it is. And then I'm going to have the 2 over 9 moved to join the 2 over 18. Plus uh, we had the 2 over 5 join us here, minus a 2 over 10. And then, uh, let's see, the 2 over 11 moved away. And so now we are at the minus 2 over 12, and etc. So let's look at what, what these guys combine to, and this really is remarkable. So we have the 2 over 1 minus the 2 over 2, that's 2 minus 1, so that just gives us 1, and so it's a big fat 1 there. And then we get 2 quarters, simplifies to 1 half, right? And the 2 thirds minus 2 sixths, well that's going to give us plus 1 third, and we get a minus one quarter, and then we get a plus one fifth, and we get a minus one sixth, etc. After all those reductions, and you see that this guy 
is exactly one half of this guy. And so this one we know is two times natural log of two, and this guy is equal to natural log of two. So just by moving around some elements of my series, we got completely different answers. And that is completely bonkers. And it, <laughs> in a nice consistent world that this shouldn't be happening. So this confused mathematicians for a, a long time. And so it took Riemann to show what was going wrong, and he showed that it can go much, much worse than this. And this is through his Riemann rearrangement theorem. Okay, so things seem so cut and dry in elementary calculus. You have a series, say like this, and you see it converges because it's say an alternating series with decreasing terms that go to zero. Done, it's the alternating harmonic series. We showed that that converges and we have you know, solved math. That is a check mark in our Calculus 2 class. But what does it converge to? This one in particular, we are told converges to say the natural log of two. And that seems to line up with our thinking about power series because it, it, these are just coefficients from the power series. And if you plug in one, well, that gives you two. But does it really? I mean, yes, it does. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the really weird thing is that it isn't the collection of numbers that adds up to the log of two. It's the sequence that adds to the log of two. If you've done any sort of calculus at all, that, that's a really weird sentence. Uh, the numbers don't add to this, but the sequence does. What nonsense are you telling them? No, hang on. I mean, this did confuse one of the greatest mathematicians of the 19th century. I mean, they, we're talking about Dirichlet here, who's like the father of like Fourier analysis as we think about it. Let's start like this. It, take the numbers, uh, you know, one, two, and three, and add them together as say one plus two plus three. Right, yeah, you get six. Now, if we swap one and two, we get two plus one plus three, and that sums to six, right? Six, duh. All right, so now having a pile of a finite number of numbers, uh, it always adds to the same number. And now, let's take this log of two series. And so essentially we showed that twice the series is equal to the series itself. Wait, 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 that, that can't be right. And so we know that can't possibly be true if mathematics is gonna be self-consistent. And we noticed that the only thing we really changed here is the ordering of the sequence. Okay, that's weird. I'll just not use this series then. The thing is, Riemann showed that it gets so, so much more worse. It happens to any conditionally convergent series, and it isn't just doubling. Uh, you can actually make it be any real number that you want. And his proof of that was like a paragraph. It was like three sentences. It is really frustrating how little detail is in there. So what I'm gonna show you and also you, uh, is a heuristic argument uh, that Riemann more or less gave, and um, you know it, it's convincing enough. And so we'll go ahead and run with that, and yeah, let's go ahead and get to the board. Oh hey, by the way, <clears throat> hey, by the way, if you like this video so far, uh, you know please take a moment to hit the like button and whatnot. It tells YouTube that you know you guys like it, and uh, you know hopefully they'll send more people like you here. In any case, I. Uh, Let's go ahead and get back to the proof. So the first thing we need to talk about is what the definition of a series actually is and how do we define what it means to be a convergence series and, and all that good stuff. So let's go ahead and start with the definition of the convergence of a series. So this is our definition of the sum of a series. It is actually a limit of partial sums. That doesn't mean it's a sum in of itself. It, it's actually a limit of sums. And so weird things can happen when you're talking about limits. So we have these infinities that we really need to worry about. And so when you have some sort of infinity happening here, a lot of weird restructuring can end up happening. What's important to know is that a series is more than the sum a collection of numbers. Order matters. What Dirichlet found was that by moving all these odd numbers around, that you actually got a completely different answer. And that tells us that order actually matters when you're summing a series. Now, this really freaked out Dirichlet, and he had no idea how to answer this problem, and it turns out that the problem is massively worse than what Dirichlet realized. So Dirichlet realized this problem, and he put it into a paper that he was writing about Fourier series. And so this is another example where Fourier series really contributed to like development of mathematics. Dirichlet also saw is that there is a time when everything is gonna be okay. And you need a series that is what is called absolutely convergent. So if the sum of a n converges, so if we take the absolute values of all these a n's, then the order doesn't matter. 
and this is what we call absolutely convergent. Most analysts, uh, we are really not comfortable if we're dealing with something that isn't absolutely convergent, and that makes, and that's what is called a conditionally convergent series. We know the alternating harmonic series doesn't converge absolutely because, well, I mean, the harmonic series was the first series we ever discovered that diverged uh, with the terms going to zero. What Riemann came along and showed us later is that if you take any conditionally convergent series, any one at all, that you can actually make it do this thing that Dirichlet said and actually make it do a lot more. So let's talk about that. The first thing we need to do is I need to show you that if we take all the positive terms, then the sum of those positive terms is going to be positive infinity. And if I take all the negative terms, the sum of all those negative terms is negative infinity. And this is going to hold true for every conditionally convergent series. So Riemann's proof itself was actually very hand wavy. It was like three sentences long and, and that was it. And so I'm going to basically break it down for you how he approached this. I am going to actually make the assumption that uh, the absolute value of a n plus one uh, is going to be less than uh, the absolute value of a n. So I'm just going to assume that our terms themselves are actually decreasing. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this, this conditionally convergent series. We're going to assume that the series itself is convergent, but that the sum of the absolute values is not. So this may, makes it a conditionally convergent series. And what that is going to end up doing is it gives us these sort of two reservoirs. We have this, the collection of all our positive numbers is going to get, become this like well that we can pull out of that's just going to you know blow up to infinity. And the one, all the negative numbers are also going to go to negative infinity. And so if we want to make something bigger, we can just keep pulling out of the positives and get as high as we want. And if we want something to be smaller, we just pull out of the negatives and get as small as we want. But first we have to demonstrate that we have these reservoirs to pull from. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, pk to be all the indices of all the positive a n terms. And I'm going to assume that this is all in order. So uh, p1 is going to be less than p2, it's less than p3, etc. And ditto for the n k terms for the negative a n. Now our claim is that this sum is going to be infinity and this sum is going to be minus infinity. We know, at the very least, that this a n term is actually convergent. So if the sum of a p k is less than infinity, uh, then the sum of a n k can't be negative infinity. And the reason for that is we know that there's some way to add these two terms together that uh, they end up converging, because we know that this is convergent. And so we knew if this was finite, then adding this, if it was equal to minus infinity, would take us all the way down to minus infinity. So that tells us that the sum of a n k is also finite. But if that was the case, then the sum of a p k uh, minus the sum of a n k would be the sum of a n in absolute value. And, uh, but we know that this is infinity. But this is finite, and this is finite. And so therefore, that would make this an absolutely convergent series if this ended up being finite plus finite, right? And we know that this is actually infinity, and so this is a contradiction. Therefore, we have this claim. Okay, so now we have our two infinite reservoirs, one going to positive infinity and one going to minus infinity. And, let's, and so now let's go ahead and put it together to get what is called the Riemann resummation theorem. Okay, so what we have is we have these two reservoirs, as I call them. So these are all of our positive terms, and we know they all add up to positive infinity, and we know that we, these are all of our negative terms, they add up to negative infinity. All right, and so this is what Riemann's resummation theorem says. It says, basically, if we go ahead and take a look at the real numbers, and we pick some number, say r, and we would like to get to r, then what we can do is we can take our positive numbers, and we're starting at zero, and we're going to add them together until we get past r. We know we eventually we can get past r because we know this adds to infinity. Even if I chop off all these terms above this point, we know that we can still use the remaining terms to get above infinity. But one other thing that comes into play here is we know that these terms have to be getting smaller. We know that because a n is convergent, so the terms have to go to zero, otherwise we wouldn't even pass the basic convergence test. So, since we know that all these terms are getting smaller, then we know we're getting more and more precise with how much we'll be overshooting. So, for instance, it might turn out that we only need, say, the first two terms to get above here. So this would be sort of our AP1, this would be our AP2, and so we're past that. 
And so then we say, okay, well, our new uh, order is so far is going to be AP1 plus AP2. So we've overshot R, and then we stop. We stop once we do that. And we know we can't be any further than R than the, this whole term AP2. So then what you do is you take your negative terms and you go the other way. So these guys all went up. And now let's take these other terms that we're going to go down. So now we know we're down below R after this say, single step. And so we're going to say this is going to be A and 1 here. And so now we're down underneath R, and so then we stop. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go up again. And this time we're going to use a P here. And so this might be, say, a, P, and we're going to go up again, and this is going to get us up to here. It's going to be A, P, 4. Now, how far away this new sum is when we add A, P, 3 plus A, P, 4, how far away we are, uh, can't be any more than this small term here. And so what we know is that our refinement, uh, we have a guarantee that at least we're going to be closer to R than the guarantee we had over here. Uh, we might have actually been closer to R the first time, but we don't know. So then we've gone up and up here, and now we're going to go down again. But now we know that the new AN term is going to be even smaller. So it might be something like this. So it would be AN2 here, and then we're going to be, say, AN3 here. And so we went down, and so we have plus AN2 plus a and 3, and then we just continue. a, p, 5, etc. And so that goes back up, and then we need to go down again. And you see that this refinement, it goes from us having this error about this big to an error of, like, say, this big, and then we have an error that's, say, no more than this, and then we have an error that is going to be this small. And so we are slowly but surely converging on our target, r. And, it, and this is all just coming from this sort of resummation and these two reservoirs knowing that I can go up as high as I want and down as low as I want. And yeah, and so that's the Riemann resummation theorem, or at least a, a, a cartoon sketch of how this ends up going. That is probably one of the most counterintuitive results in all of real analysis, even though it is so simple to state. It confused mathematicians of the 19th century for a long time, and it tells us to be very careful if you're reordering the sum, because sums depend on the order of the sequence, unless you're working with an absolute convergence series. So a series isn't just a sum. It is the limit of partial sums of a sequence, and sequences care about order. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a good day.